This week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Storyblocks is the world's best stock media service offering video, audio, and images with the most affordable subscription plans on the market. Their ever-growing library has over 1 million high-quality, royalty-free assets, so you can bring your content to life more quickly and efficiently than ever before. With Storyblocks' unlimited all-access plan, you get unlimited downloads of everything in the library, so you can you can try out multiple options and find the perfect fit for whatever you're making, whether it's a video, a podcast, or just some graphic. Learn more and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Again, that's storyblocks.com <coughs> slash only a test. Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 14th, 2021, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Dot com. Hey, I don't know about you guys, but I'm at CES right now. Mm-hmm. We're all We're at all- CES right now. <laughs> Kishore Hari, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I mean, considering. I, I feel yeah. like I have to add the considering to any <laughs> statement of how well I'm doing these days. It's understood. It's understood. We're all doing something considering. Considering is the undertone of 2021. No returns, though. We've gone, we're have gone. we two weeks in. Jeremy Williams, how about you? How are you doing? Uh, I'm great. This is my favorite CES ever. It's also my first, and I love this. This is great. <laughs> You know, just like being there, you've missed half the keynotes. Uh, you're busy checking your email. Uh, it's uh, well, you know, it, it smells probably better, right? <laughs> than any CES before. Yeah. I spend so much time in my office. I'm not so sure about that. Like, I leave my office for five minutes and I come back in. I'm like, what is that stench? Really? Oh, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> There are things called air fresheners, probably yeah. even smart air fresheners. Or windows. I could, you know, open one. <laughs> windows. Yeah, that's that's the good one. You can tell Norm is excited about CES because he's a little hot on the mic right now. I love it. Oh, I love oh, it. I you're like, my... you're enthusiastic in a way you haven't been for a long time. I love, look, oh, let's keep it going. Keep it going. CES live show. Oh, <sighs> You know, I hadn't been to the physical CES, I think, two the past two years and this would have been the third year well i don't know if we would have gone this year maybe i don't know if if there if if travel was possible if like the vaccine was all distributed toward the end of last year and everyone was good i think cs would have been this really exciting way to to get back into travel and see people because it's a gathering of all you know the people we know in tech um but i i do miss it i miss i miss the the ritual of going to vegas uh you know not just the going to vegas part but the the whole landing at the airport the big convention center the scrambling for hotels the long lines for the taxis all the 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 pop and circumstance of of the the cs floor you know trying to make your way from one meeting to another meeting across the the two halls um sitting on the hallway floor for this box lunch they give you all of that I, I i do miss it yeah. You are alone you, in Michigan. <laughs> neither of you guys have been to CES, though. Right. I mean, E3, Jeremy, you've been to. And that's that's yeah, comparable. I would n- I have never missed E3. I've never missed going to E3 in all my years of not going to E3 and being happy. Really? <laughs> yeah, no. No, I mean I have I have good memories of being a youngster, you know, and new newly hired at, at PC Gamer and getting to go to E3 and you know, it's a magical place, isn't it? With lots of people who want your attention. But um, nowadays, it, being at home, you get all of the same information and at the pace that you want. And it's it's wonderful. There's, I mean, I, I, we've probably talked about this before, like favorite memories of these events. There, there is something different about being, being there. Like I remember being at the Sam's, the LG event. It was LG or Samsung? Um, the uh, the the famous Michael Bay press conference where they were showing TVs. I think it, it was Samsung. It must have been Samsung uh, at CES. 
uh, sitting, uh, sitting next to the Ars Technica folks. You know, they were rolling out their new TVs, and then they had a special presentation by Michael Bay. He came out, and it was right before the third Transformers film. And he was started talking, doing a spiel, and then he stopped and said, oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Yeah, And then famous. just walked off stage. I forgot and about it. We all it, looked yeah. at him. Was this a bit? Like, was Optimus Prime going to come down? And was it going to be, like, this, the lights coming down? And it was a big, like, like here's Optimus Prime on a giant Samsung TV. But no, it was the teleprompter didn't work, and he didn't, he couldn't. He couldn't finish the, <laughs> the presentation. Yeah, what did he just get like, stage fright or something? I, I I don't know. I think that they so rely on the teleprompters yeah. to let them know what they're going to say. They couldn't. They didn't have the talking points, and everything. Every bit of those of those keynotes are so scripted. Uh, you know, to, to every beat, you know, it's it's tough to riff. And and you hear the the stories of like how how some of these you know the the things that have gone wrong because it is orchestrated, right? It's a big dog and pony show. But it, yeah, it it being tied to the Las Vegas Hotel Casino Convention Center atmosphere, where you no know, you couldn't escape it. Right? You could you would be you know at your hotel at you know the the, the Paris Las Vegas, and you walk down to the lobby, you sit down at a blackjack table at two a.m. in the morning after filing your stories and everyone at the table were there for ces people still in their their business casual and and talking shop and talking about the things they saw on the show floor and you're not going to get that this year but you're going to get a bunch of video streams press releases there are people that have been briefed on all sorts of laptops and phones and weird gadgets and we'll talk about all that but completely unrelated is our top story this week so let me play the cue if I can find it, here we go. Top story this week. Top story isn't from the world of tech. It's from the world of video games. Lucasfilm Games is the new name, the branding of the new entity out of Lucasfilm. Uh, that's the umbrella uh, oversight over all of their licensed games. It's not Lucas Arts. I really, I don't know if I wish if, if that would have been too too much of a nostalgia play. Like in my heart, I want it to be Lucas Arts and all the things and all the things that 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 brings along with it. But it's Lucasfilm Games, and along with that, we had two big announcements. The first one out of Bethesda course the makers of fallout the owners of quake and doom uh, they are making their version of uncharted but it's an indiana jones game <laughs> yeah isn't that just uncharted like it's just un i mean <laughs> I, I think the the internet joke was we can't wait for all the teenagers out there in the tweens to call this an uncharted ripoff uh, when uncharted was obviously very very inspired by the likes of tomb raider and Indiana Jones, but of course it's become its own thing and it's a great story and, and a great world of, and, and fantastic games that Naughty Dog has made. Uh, but Bethesda, not who I thought to make an Indiana Jones game. Who would you have thought? I mean, it, it depends on, uh, it, I, I think. Naughty Dog. Yeah, no, I mean, Naughty Dog. Yeah, it, it, People who make it, like, these type of adventure games or, or an Ubisoft, like an Assassin's Creed type thing. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what type of game they're, they're going to make. Right. Uh, what they've said is it's a new Indiana Jones game with an original story from Machine Game. So Bethesda also owned Machine Games. Machine Games made Wolfenstein um, and all the, all the first person. So is this going to be a first person Indiana Jones game? Like they did a great job with the story of the Wolfenstein reboot and all the sequels. And those have been very successful. Those are old school run and gun FPS games. You're just shooting Nazis and and yes, Indiana Jones punches Nazis, but he uses his whip. Like, how do you how do you translate that into a fun next gen console and PC game experience? Oh, you, you you make Uncharted. I, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, uh, I, I know people are excited about this because of the the IP and Bethesda has earned a lot of uh, credibility in terms of uh, uh, partnering here. But it's like, what is left in the story? that I want to see that isn't told through other similar games. 
don't mean to be too cynical here, but, you know, Tomb Raider, Uncharted, they've told these types of stories a bunch of times. So I just don't see what innovation is going to come through this that we're not getting from other things. Also, the way Lucasfilm approaches these licensed games, we've had Indiana Jones games in the past, and they're, I don't know if they're considered canonical, like is the only thing that's canon for Indiana Jones, the films plus maybe the young Indiana Jones TV show, which Harrison Ford appeared once in, like, are those only things in, in, in everything like novelizations, comic books, games, those are all just in the world of uh, Indiana Jones is also kind of locked into mid 20th century, right? It is early, early 20th century. So like it, it there's only, it's kind of, so much of it is tied around, you know, the, the rise of world war two and in fascist Germany and, and Indiana Jones kind of exploring and going and venturing in the chaos of that. Um, it's gotta be like that era too, right? It, I can't imagine it being set in, you know, the, the 60s or 70s, the the older Indiana Jones that the last movie was set in. I think you guys are overthinking this one. I think if it's a, if it's a good game, then we will play it, and we a lot more people will play it at first because of that that title, the Indiana Jones logo across the top of the box or whatever it is your your Steam page. Uh, you know, that's all. It, that's the only reason they're doing a license is to get people's attention and get people to give it a shot. And if it's a good game, people will play it. And this this game studio is. Has is known for making really big budget good games, so I I think I'm optimistic. I think this this could be a very good thing. Hear me out. I have an idea. What if this game isn't about Indiana Jones, but Indiana the dog? <laughs> the, dog. Like, <laughs> <laughs> the namesake. I love it. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, what, what Come about- on, that's got to be a DLC. If they well, don't do that as a DLC, I don't know why we're even talking. Norm, about when you mentioned like w- the whip, my my mind went straight to VR, and that won't happen because the market's not there yet. But imagine that. That would be cool. A whip mechanic, which we saw in that one rec room quest. Yes, but that wasn't really a physics based whip mechanic. Exactly, that was just a, a, a can animation where the whips rolled out and became, you know, a, a slow pistol right. type thing. Uh, but there are you know, whips that you can whip style physics things that you can look to in VR. Um, Bethesda has made VR games, but we don't know if they're going to continue. There have been like they had the VR thing for Wolfenstein, which is like a short level. They had the VR Doom game, which is probably their biggest dive in. But I don't know if that was mandated because of the lawsuits they had right. going on to really cement their footing in in VR and and the VR market, as we'll talk about, you know, last year has grown. You know, over million million new users in VR and Steam. Um, I don't think it'll be a VR first game. I think that it'll probably be a third person game, which makes the most sense, which makes it even less likely for it to be ported to VR. Uh, if they're going to play into nostalgia, you know, bring back short round, bring back some great NPCs, <laughs> great side characters. I think Temple of Doom era is way more fun than uh, Last Crusade and even the what? Raiders era. I, I, when I think of Temple of Doom, I don't think of fun. I think of like ripping hearts out of people's chests. That's fun. Yeah. That's like what? temple. Like, that's like that's like you know exploring tombs and 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 temples and and doom <laughs> <laughs> and and the club Obi Wan. You know that kind it, of stuff. It, the ramifications of this is this a reaction to EA getting stuff so wrong with like Battlefront and like loot boxes and all of that kind of stuff? Is this the end? The beginning of the end of EA and Lucasfilm working together? I mean, that's the undertone. That's the subtext for all of this. I think it's no, it's not been a secret that Disney and even Bob Iger got involved was unhappy with uh, the Battlefront launch and all the loot boxes and the controversy around that. And I think EA still has standing, contractual standing with Lucasfilm. They tweeted out they're going to still be making Star Wars games. And to their credit, Fallen Order was really great and i uh they've done a really great job with um with uh uh the what does name escape me Fl- flying in x-wings um what <laughs> <laughs> the game we just played squadrons oh, squadrons Star thank Wars you squadrons. yes yes I had, I had a dad brain fart for a moment uh they did a great job updating squadrons and so yeah. I, I think they've recovered from the missteps of battlefront 
but I think Lucasfilm and Disney definitely look to that as you know, as opposed to spending a hundreds of millions of dollars doing an in-house studio, which Lucas Arts was uh, working with some some people, other companies who are just chomping at the bit to to make games in those IP. You know, um, Fallen Order didn't start out as a Star Wars game. You know, it started out as as a as an original IP that the that the studio had, and they were developing, oh. and they were shopping it around, and then it got um, converted into one. It was like, hey, how about you take this awesome game you pitched us and make it Star Wars? Um, and they were on board, and it turned out, as you said, it turned out great. Um, and that's, that's, I, I wonder if that's the same kind of thing that we're going to see here, because you could take it like you could have taken Fallen Order and it could become a Indiana Jones game if you lose the sci-fi and make it, you know, whips and, and tombs. It, the scope is different. I mean, Fallen Order, one of the great things it did was build it successfully built onto some Jedi mythology, you know, filled in the blanks. They also had some really giant set pieces with like the you know destruction of the empire is all post um episode uh the three um and so you had or the the fall of the the republic and so it worked it works in the star wars works in the scope and the scale in the way that indiana jones doesn't really unless we're talking about like jungles and big temples but it's all you know localized and, and earth stuff uh, but in the Star Wars universe, the other big Lucasfilm games announcement, right? They announced it was like one announcement after another. They announced the name of this uh, of this new umbrella um, uh, branding of Lucasfilm games, then the Indiana Jones from uh, Bethesda, and then Ubisoft just two days ago uh, announced that they're making an open world Star Wars game uh, with their development studio that did the Division. I never played the division. I'm like the one person who didn't. Did you I, guys play I never it? played it either. No. Okay. no. It, 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 I think Division Two has a lot of fans, and uh, those games are always. I mean, they are graphically pretty intense, but they, they did some really novel things with the UI and you know and and uh, some of the the kind of future tech they did in in, in their open world. Um, but uh, the EA deal is apparently a 10-year exclusivity deal they did in 2013, right? Right after Disney bought Lucas Lucasfilm and closed LucasArts. So this will probably be after that in 2022 or 2023, unless there's some renegotiation. Can can I jump in a second? Did you guys yeah. just feel that? Was there an oh, earthquake? earthquake? There no. was an earthquake. Maybe it's yeah. coming my way from you. No, I don't I didn't feel it. It's small. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna check on this. I'm gonna fact <laughs> you gotta check, check this. on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm into it. I mean, I think the the fear that people immediately when they see Ubisoft and open world Star Wars is is this going to be Assassin's Creed at Star Wars? And one, if even, even if it was Assassin's Creed at Star Wars, I'd play that. And two, it doesn't sound like it's going to be that because it's the studio that did the division. And the crew, so I think they'll be, probably be a little more inventive with the mechanics. And what if it's a Mandalorian game, open world Mando universe game, or in the world of the Mandalorian? Right? Doesn't I? I I'd be totally down for that. I can be convinced. Like Jeremy said, it just has to be a good game. Like like we can. Uh, talk around, you know, all the the IP, the mechanics, and all that kind of stuff. Just give me a good story yeah. um, that that uh, you, you know with a compelling uh, character and villain, and I'll be down. Uh, yeah, Lord knows I'm not going anywhere for another long time. So, uh, video games are pretty much the only thing keeping me sane. Am I sane? I'm not sure. I might have felt a <laughs> phantom earthquake just now. So. <laughs> Uh, one thing I hope that Lucasfilm Games doesn't just focus on big IP, big budget games, that if they're going to supervise and license out the franchises, that they do look back at the LucasArts catalog and look maybe for smaller developers um, to take over some of the more beloved franchises that they still have the rights to uh, and, and bring that into uh, you know mobile gaming or, uh, or next-gen gaming. Uh, and I think there's going to be an appetite in the community um, for those type of games, you know, bring bring back Monkey Island, right? Bring back bring back uh, 
N- and, and not just the yeah. th- not just the, the d- double fine stuff and Tim Schafer stuff, but they, I mean, they just did like a collector's pack for Monkey Island. If you want to spend like one hundred and fifty dollars, mm. you can get all kinds of feelies and like uh, a nice box. All types of feelies. Did you see the thing that Sean showed uh, for one of his favorite things last year? Mm-mm. It was um, it was a print, uh, a fan art, uh, an artist um, did a fan recreation of the box cover for Monkey Island, uh, but she did it in um, a. Uh, she actually sketched it, so it was like a physical print. So it was a sketch, like etched. It was an etched, like I don't know what you would call it, um, metal plate. Mm-hmm. with the image and then that was then put ink on and then pressed onto and and and, and wow. um onto a, a print that it looked gorgeous anyway sean loved that thing uh anyway let's move on um to some pop culture Wait, I, I need to say this for my own sanity and to yeah. prove to the listeners I'm not crazy. There was a 3.8 earthquake that what? happened uh, during that first segment, which is pretty small. It was about 12 miles from where I sit. So if you go back in the video, can you see any of our cameras do a little bit of shake, I wonder? I don't know. We'll leave that to the listeners. I, don't, I couldn't feel it at all. I don't think I felt like the last three earthquakes of that magnitude in the Bay Area. Yeah, no idea. All right. As you're listening to this, WandaVision has probably just dropped on Disney+. Plus. There have been some early reviews of the first couple episodes. No spoilers. Uh, but the early critics' take is that it is just as weird as the trailers have promised, which is all a good sign and a good thing. And thus begins never-ending MCU, right? With WandaVision and, Cap- and uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, all the other TV shows, Loki, and then the movies theoretically coming back later this year. But we're about to e- enter some never-ending MCU. Uh, I'm very excited for WandaVision. I hope you guys are as well. I, I hope this I, we'll be able to talk about I, next week. I, I want to tamp down expectations. Like if I went back to like 13-year-old me and I was like, can you believe there's going to be a Scarlet Witch and Vision TV show. You couldn't get me excited about that. You couldn't pay me to read those comic books back in the day. Why not? So, because they're weird, doofy characters. Like huh. Vision is was like a robot with no personality, which Paul Bettany is kind of what quite well captured. Uh, and Scarlet Witch <laughs> was kind of weird. Um, She's weird. He's fast, right? It, uh, and so like... Uh, it there was no like compelling kind of storyline. I I kind of have a sense of what comic they're pulling from for this uh, series, uh, but I, I I don't think like the comic w- was good. The series that I w- would be really excited about based on the source material is the is the Hawkeye TV show, um, right. because I think it's based on the Matt Fraction comic uh, to a certain extent, and that one is just. It's really good. And I, um, you know, that came out not too long ago. Uh, So I'm keeping my expectations low. I mean, what you're saying is everything we want to hear about it, that it's weird, that it's the sort of forward thinking. But man, these characters stink when we really unpack (laughs) it. So like, uh, let's let's keep our expectations appropriate low. I think there's also a question of appetite. I think, you know, back when you were 13, there were lots of comic book things on TV and in in the comics world. And a Wanda and Vision TV show would get lost in the Spider-Man TV show and and the Fantastic Four TV show and the X-Men TV show. And now we're talking about the MCU where every piece that's coming out feels momentous and feels like it's going to tease out this bigger universe and this bigger storyline that they've created and in fact this being the first thing we're seeing uh, after you know uh, spider-man far from home you know, we don't know where wanda has been and, and vision is dead like how does vision come back those questions uh feel so so big in, in the mcu fans i think you mentioned a hawkeye being the one that's the most exciting for you that one feels like the most standalone tv show because you know loki is supposed to and a question that was uh, asked in Endgame of where that Loki character went. Uh, same with Falcon Winter Soldier at the end of that movie. These are all you know threads that were teased. Hawkeye, 
they didn't make, need to make that show, but that one is exciting because it is a direct adaptation. It feels like of a standalone comic book, and that and that one will be probably a big test of the the power of the MCU. Although I'm fine, I'm sure they'll find some way to tie it with the into the bigger story as well. Uh, the people responsible for the shows, the actors, and Kevin Feige have been doing interview rounds, and there's more information teased about the future of the MCU. Uh, just some big, a few nuggets of information here and there. One, uh, Deadpool will be part of the MCU and will be a rated R film. That was uh, something that we didn't know. It was up in the air as to whether they would tone that down. And you know, this is kind of. It's interesting because it makes sense from a business standpoint. Deadpool 1 and 2 were both R-rated films. They made a ton of money. There's obviously a lot of anticipation for it. Um, uh, but there's also controversy of whether Marvel, uh, you know, with Scott Derrickson, who is going to direct Doctor Strange 2, uh, Multiverse of Madness, uh, the word being that he stepped away from the project because Marvel didn't let him go as dark as and as hardcore as he wanted to go in terms of making a, a, a maybe a rated R film. That one's going to be Sam Raimi directed in PG-13. Uh, but Deadpool is, it's a, it's an outlier. He's an outlier of a character. Um, uh, Kevin Feige also talked about uh, not. He wouldn't reveal when the end of Phase 4 would be, although this kicks off Phase 4, really, Scar- uh, WandaVision. And uh, the news that just broke this morning, and this is more business news than anything, is that Deadline's reporting that Chris Evans is now back in talks with Marvel to maybe come back, not necessarily in a starring role for uh, Captain America 4, but to be come back as Cap in some form in a future MCU film. Is this necessary? Is this, I, I don't know if this is something I can get excited about or I, I want. I, I would actually, I'm expecting it. I'm expecting like RDJ to come back at some point in some thing. I would just prefer it to be some kind of crazy, unexpected cameo than to have these leaks about, um, you, you know, about contracts and all that kind of stuff. Just make it a cameo and be done with it. <laughs> and if it's a cameo that makes sense in, inside the context of the story, great. If it's just a cameo, I don't think they would do it and just have it be a cameo. I think that would that would be the thing that would be least interesting to Chris Evans because he made a big thing about stepping away from the character the last time he picked up his shield. So it would have to be interesting creatively for him to want to do it, to even entertain the thought. And that says that they ha- they pitched him a really good idea. Is he super well liked as Captain America? Like oh, yeah. I, yeah. I mean I, I think I think he's fine, but in no way does he compare to Robert Downey Jr. Like in terms of a of a draw for me. I, I would much prefer to see Robert Downey Jr. Uh, reincarnated as an AI or something. He doesn't even have to show up to do like on camera work. He could just show up to do voice acting. It's kind of like when they when they do the uh, the in HUD vision. Like you hear these stories, but when they were filming Iron Man one and two, it's literally John Favreau going over to Robert Downey Jr.'s house and setting up a camera and some a green screen. He would just like just riff off lines, and then they would composite his face and put the CG HUD interfaces, and that would punch up a lot of the scenes. Mm. Uh, the, the word from Deadline is that it's supposed to be a role that's akin to Robert Downey Jr.'s role in Spider-Man. You know, how he appeared in Spider-Man as just a mentor figure, just for a few select scenes. And, you know, the maybe it's a way for them to... I mean, they already have Falcon Winter Soldier. Like, the Captain America mantle has moved on. Um, I, I don't know... There's always the possibility that there will be a movie set in the past and he will be in the movie because he existed from the 50s onward. That's not interesting at all. (laughs) I mean, that's a that's a cameo role. That's like if if, I don't think an an actor, you know, tied to the role wants to wants to just show up for a day. Maybe maybe like that's the trick. Like he had to he had to be like uh, Captain America, but he had to do it in a way that no one would find out about it. Right, so that could be interesting. Where he's he has to play it stealthy. Uh, there's also speculation that because in in between the last few scenes of Endgame, where you have Cap America go back in time to return all the stones before he comes back, and he's old. There's a whole life that he lived, and so the 
the money is on maybe him, the storytelling of him returning the stones. But that's, I think, also a story that's better left unexplored and better just left up to our imagination as well. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I hope it's a passing. of. I hope it's brought in for good reason creatively. And you know, fans are going to lose their minds when, when it happens. And these kind of reports have to come out because of contracts and, you know, and, and, and posturing from all the, all the business negotiation side. So we'll see what comes of it. Probably not, nothing soon. Probably not phase, you know, phase four. But Chris Evans isn't getting any younger. And Captain America doesn't get older. Or does he? <laughs> Uh, Lord of the Rings, the show is supposed to come out this year. This is that massive Amazon TV show that they they spent hundreds of millions of dollars, remember, just buying the rights, not even production, just buying the rights to all of Lord of the Rings. And uh, it's been now they've shared, uh, they've, they've announced the, uh, the synopsis, the plot synopsis to what this show will be about. And it'll be about uh, the rise and the return of Sauron thousands of years before the events of The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So the big flashback that you saw at the beginning of Lord of the Rings, when the elves, have, when Hugo Weaving and and when, uh, what was, um, uh, Isildur? The big battle. Yes, that big battle. It's going to be the events probably leading up to that big battle. They said that it will have familiar faces and new faces, of course, new characters, familiar places, uh, and they have, even though they haven't confirmed that it is in the same cinematic world as the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings, because it is all under that same rights umbrella, uh, the assumption is they'll be tapping into that aesthetic and, and that design, and maybe even some of those actors as well. I just hope they bring back Kate Blanchett to narrate. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, that, that narration that she did was not part of the original cut that was done after the fact in the extended cut you know, they just showed the scenes and then they had to look at their cast of characters and say oh who would be an appropriate voice and it was just so perfect i mean it's burned that music tied to her that overture narration is such an important part of lord of the rings yeah yeah that's an easy job for her to do as well um last bits of pop culture news super mario world in Japan, Universal Studios, the opening was supposed to be February 4th. It's pushed back. No. Because of COVID? I think yeah. Because of yeah, Osaka, uh, Osaka region uh, issued a state of emergency related to COVID. And so that state of emergency runs through the beginning of February. So that's why they've pushed back the opening. This is sort of inevitable for this time period, but we also are seeing reasons to believe that this is, a, you know, a relatively short term measure. This isn't going to be like a probably like six month or something pushback. It's probably only going to be a, a, a month or two. I, I want to live vicariously so much through the, the people who get to go to that theme park. And yeah, will you watch parks. the videos of all the rides? I probably will. I, uh, you, can't, you can't do it for the Mario Kart one because there's AR involved. How yeah, would you yeah. That? I don't. Do you want to know? Because I I have like the ridiculous idea in my head. I'm like, yeah, we could just go to Japan. No problem. I'll have that conversation with my wife. No problem. Uh, <laughs> it's gonna make its way over to to Florida eventually, uh, and you know all the the lessons I'll learn about running that place. I mean. We also see like theme parks, they have these ambitious openings and ambitious plans when they roll out new areas in terms of like the mood, the food uh, and the type of attractions. And sometimes that stuff gets scaled down. So the park may never be as good as when you know it opened, uh, when it first opens. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I can't wait. I want, I want to go back to Disneyland. I want to go back to Disney World. Not anytime soon. Uh, I mean, Disney's opening. They're doing that, the Galactic Cruiser the the uh what is it the hyperion oh the the uh, hotel in florida the hotel right that's that's still under construction right and yeah that these are all these are all things to look forward to as we get back to a normal the next normal. people going to disneyland are, are getting covid treatments yeah how about that down in anaheim it's going to become a big vaccination site yep. although it's this isn't main street we're talking about this is like 
Outside. Disneyland. The parking, the parking lot. lot. Parking yeah. lot. Disneyland, right? <laughs> right? There's no, they know they're, they're not going to be queuing in for Snow White's ride right? and, and, and the, the Seven Dwarves ride and then getting their shots and then getting and then doing the, the roller coaster. That's, that's not you know, happening. You know what? I don't have a, a lot of great things to say about our government's response, but that was the right call. I think just like, let's just keep it in the parking lot instead of like winding the, the line through the castle. Probably the right call. Uh, all right, before we move on to our next segment, I want to let you know that this is only a test this week. Again, it is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Now, more than ever, storytellers and content creators are challenged with producing more video content at a higher quality and distributing on more platforms than ever before. We're well aware of this, being content creators here. Storyblocks makes it easy for creators to keep up with the growing demands for modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and sac- stop sacrificing your vision due to time, budget, or resources. Storyblocks is, again, the world's best stock media service offering video audio and images and the, the most affordable subscription plans and tools on the market their ever-growing library has over 1 million high quality assets including 4k footage after effects and premiere pro templates music images sound effects and more and their assets are royalty free so you can use that content anywhere for commercial and personal use and with storybox unlimited all access plan you get unlimited downloads of everything in their library so you can try out multiple options and find the perfect fit for whatever you're making and even if your subscription ends everything you've downloaded is yours to keep for Ever. Things like the uh, Adobe After Effects and Premiere Pro templates. Music. Music is so important. The royalty-free music, it really elevates the type of video you can make and makes it feel like you have a big budget studio behind you when you can just be a content creator on your own. Explore the library and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. Check it out and that helps support us and lets us keep on doing this podcast. All right, here's some tech news. Well, let's start with maybe the weird of CES first. Sure. Where do you want to start? Do you want to start with a flying taxi? Or do you want to start with uh, transparent OLEDs that were seem to be everywhere? You, you let's choose. Do, let's do Flying Taxi. Uh, this was, uh, I, I don't know if you saw the demo for this. This is a GM announcement for a Cadillac, what they called an eVTOL uh, device that was straight out of, I don't know, I would almost call it like out of um, uh, Total Recall or something like that, Blade Runner-esque. It's like, it's this kind of like, faux personal helicopter um and they showed sort of renderings of this thing and animations of it of this electric powered personal hover helicopter um and you know i think it can it can fit two people it can go about like 60 miles an hour uh it makes no sense whatsoever but it's also super cool um that they have a rendering for for something like this so um you, you know, like weirdly, this is what I was into for CES. Let's let's be clear. This is a rendering. It's not a physical thing. Yeah, they did not indicate whether they actually have a functional prototype or not. It looks absolutely like a concept art out of Westworld, the latest season when they went out into the real world. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of like uh, uh, these kind of quadcopter designs, because it's four rotors, four big rotors with this pod squeezed between them, it is a novel take on the multi-rotor design because the rotors are on separate planes of axes. So it can tilt forward mm-hmm. presumably and, and give you some VTOL style like forward um, um, movement. It also looks like the kind of thing that I would never want to get into. hundred <laughs> percent. It feels like it'll tilt immediately. Yes, right. <laughs> right. Like the renderings they have of their launch pads feel like the pods are way too close to each other already <laughs> and then you have more than one taking off at once that's a high risk of potential crashing uh also you i would never want to have this on top of a skyscraper launching with the winds right like the the weakest these motors are the, the most unsteady a multi-rotor is is as it's about to take off as its motors are are ramping up and we're talking about 
taking off from a 50 story building it's high winds up there yeah um gm okay <laughs> like this is this is also under their cadillac brand so jim jim yeah. had a lot of news in ces and it's all this kind of futuristic electric stuff news including a new bolt so yeah, yeah I, the, this is to get attention for that, right? Like this right. is so we're talking about the crazy stuff because what's really practical is you know them going forward thinking and of course continuing with their their bolt car. It, it, rightly or wrongly, the uh, the richest person in the world right now runs an electric vehicle company. Um, you know, I know that's on paper. I know that's not real, but we are at a point where like the cost of uh, cost and acceptability of electric vehicles is uh, has transformed dramatically, uh, and it feels like emerging from uh, the, this pandemic period. I, yes, this is the absolute right bet. Um, my son is picking out colors for the Bolt that he wants. That's the <laughs> level we're at. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah. One of us. <laughs> Are there more than two colors? Is it not just blue and gray? We what? we saw somebody on our screen has the like super lime green, and I think that's what caught his eye. Um, it's what what the kids want. It's new AirPods. Okay. It's what they're talking about on the on the playgrounds. Uh, right. No, right. Like, my thirteen <laughs> my thirteen year old thinks you have the coolest car, Norm. I mean, if fair, if you want to be fair, just the, um, the Model Three. Yeah, he just doesn't think you have the cool rims. Oh. What? <laughs> wait, 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 wait! Which ones are the cool rims? <laughs> the black ones. The, the dark the, ones, the aerodynamic ones. Mm -hmm. Those are not the the apple. They look like apple slices. <laughs> I'll, I'll let like him you, know. You, you, you let you let your son know <laughs> that those rims, even though they get you slightly better uh, the uh, mileage, look like an apple sliced in half. Uh, <laughs> the aerodynamic rims on the Model Y are slightly better. Uh, they they're speed holes, Norm. Uh, <laughs> let's talk about some of the other stuff. Uh, the transparent o uh, OLEDs, should we talk about that? Yeah. I mean, this isn't a new technology per se. Like we've been seeing stuff, I think going back to like 2017, 2016 with transparent uh, um, uh, screens. And it's essentially the idea is, is, is not anything fantastic. Actually, uh, friends have tested, Evan and Caitlin actually built a transparent screen on their maker channel uh, a, a couple weeks ago. But, you know, Basically, if you have a substrate in an LED uh, that is transparent, so that, um, you can see through the screen, or it has at least like you know 40, 80 percent transparency, depending on it. And then when you light up the actual uh, LED, that pixel lights up and it's not transparent anymore. That's basically how it works. It's not uh, super complicated. They're expensive. LG displayed one that like rolled up out of your bed, and then at the foot of your bed, you had a transparent OLED. I think what Everything you saw with the transparent OLEDs is that there's a high degree of glare coming off the screen. So I don't know how functional they are. I thought what was interesting, and this is very Blade Runner, is when they showed transparent OLEDs being used in places that are like windows, like on subway trains where they're windows so they could be like dynamic displays of maps and other stuff. Um, but still operate as a window. I thought that was much more interesting. I could imagine like going to a mall or like a office building that it would be like a directory of some sort. I think there's something there. I thought, and it's just cool that they can make clear substrates for LED TVs. Yeah, it, the, for the home makes no sense. Like when when you, when no. you, I think like a couple months back when we saw uh, was it almost it was a couple it might have been a year ago when we saw like the first transparent OLED concept uh, being talked about. It might have been last year's CES. Like. We didn't understand how it worked, but also like, why would you need, why would you want to have a TV that you could see the wall behind the TV? And what is interesting about that? Nothing. But subway, you know, signage makes 100%, mm -hmm. you know, mall signage and, and uh, stores. This is all very Blade Runner Minority Report uh, mm -hmm. tech and they need these companies have consumer divisions and they have b2b divisions and they've got to ramp up the fabrication on, on these they'll be very expensive to start but it's also that kind of um symbol of, of wealth if someone can afford however many thousands of dollars it costs one of these great they have one and it moves the tech forward uh, uh can i interest you in a rollable phone how about that depends who makes did it. you see these yeah but uh th these are from lg right LG and TCL announced one too. These are literally like, so Jeremy, if you didn't see this, it's like you hold a phone 
and then you hit a button and the screen magically sort of expands. It rolls out the LED. So you can have like a phone that essentially turns into a tablet seamlessly through this expanding mechanism. It uh, It's basically like if, if you took a fold phone and took out having to fold it, it just kind of appeared. Um, it I actually thought this looked pretty cool. Not very realistic in the short term, but if you want something that operates as a tablet and a phone, maybe it's also something that has another physical mechanism that you're talking about, just like foldable phones, uh, unnecessarily adds complexity and breakage points. Like you're talking about two articulating arms that go up on the sides, extending arms on the sides, and then a unfurling unroll uh, display uh, in addition to the software that has to match that. Yeah. It's, it's the baby steps. Like what we want to get to eventually is not needing the arms on the side that you just unroll the newspaper or you have something. It, it, scroll phones. Guys, scroll with like a hand elder crank? scrolls. No, no, you like you pull it like, <laughs> oh. like, like in the, like 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 in elder scrolls. You like you have you, you have like a stick and then you two sticks and you pull them open and you get your daily news. Right. It's gonna get. It's gonna get to that eventually. It's, you get, you get, Actually, the, get the whole family around. Say, "Hear ye, hear ye!" <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and then you talk to a, a Alexa from there. Right? It's a portal. You open up and you cast your your spell, or it's transparent, uh, 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 transparent OLED, and then you get to see through it, and it's AR. You're saying something, sure. No, I was gonna say what what weird thing caught your eye because I am actually weirdly excited about that, but it's it's obviously not mature yet as a uh, technology Razor, piece. Razor had two things that caught my eye. They're bonkers. I'm already <laughs> shaking my head at one of these things. <laughs> okay, one is the, the the wackier thing. Well, both are wacky, but the one that most likely will not be a product is their Project Brooklyn, and it's a it's a pod. It's a it's a computing pod, a, basically a chair with a, a lap desk built into the arms, and then a descending, curved, giant wraparound display that's also transparent OLED. It is basically like a out of the matrix level. Hook yourself up to uh, a gaming uh, rig where. Uh, you, you know, the everything is at your your control. It is a combination of up and the matrix where it's like you will never leave that chair. Uh, so I thought the whole mechanism of it descending and having a transparent um, uh, OLED in that context actually kind of makes sense because it can kind of go away and all this stuff. It was way over the top and ridiculous, though. What why would you want it? What's the point of it going away? Because what are you doing in that chair? Well, it's just a chair a then. <laughs> then it's just it's a, a chair, chair. <laughs> it's your like lazy boy chair in your living room no in your living room. <laughs> so then there's a missed opportunity for the descending screen to not articulate as the chair leans back right so real lazy boy where as you get full recline then the screen comes down and you're on the matrix pose then your arms are out. You're staring at the. You have the screens coming at you, and then you're ready to let the Nebuchadnezzar back into home into Zion. Uh, RGB LEDs all around the base and the sides, of course, along the chair. So RGB lighting that's a hallmark of uh, of the Razer products. Uh, there's also RGB LED lighting in their other project called Project Hazel, and it is a smart mask. Okay, this is totally unnecessary. So this is a N95 mask that has audio sensors in it with two built-in speakers that can take your sort of muffled voice through an N95 mask and articulate it out through these speakers um, with higher fidelity. Now, (laughs) this is dumb because you can hear people through masks. Like, so, like, it has no purpose uh, it also comes with a case that'll sanitize your mask for you. Uh, unnecessary. Uh, and like also speakers and all these sound things, they move by moving air. Like they vibrate the air, right? <laughs> so like, wh- is this going to defeat its actual purpose by doing that? I don't know. 
So they say active ventilation, whatever that means. Like, is, are is are they actually are there fans in there moving the air? Uh, the unmuffling is much less interesting than the cyberpunk potential of this being not only full control of light, maybe sound activated lights, and also distorting of your voice. That's so you it. Can, if so they, you can do your Darth Vader voice, your yes. Star voice, and walk in the world, and that's cyberpunk. They haven't announced that as a feature, though, right? Because that would make that would be like the killer app for this. I mean, you're gonna see teenagers and, and kids walk down the street and like in, at night with with their Blade Runner umbrellas, and as they're talking, they're gonna as they're breathing, as they're breathing, you're gonna get the red glow, and then you're gonna get your Darth <laughs> Vader voice. <laughs> I, I don't think that's the I, I mean, this isn't from Razor, but the coolest thing I saw again, we're not the market for this is this smart lipstick uh, device. Did you see this? So it, you can basically take a picture and color match based on a picture of your face, the exact color of lipstick you want. And this lipstick, which costs, I think, three hundred dollars actually has sources of pigment inside of it that'll color match to the the actual pigment you decide on the photo and create a lipstick color on the fly that you want so that you can apply it. And so it's about creating custom colors on the on the fly and it has these cartridges that you insert that serve as like the the pigment. Like <laughs> again, I, I wouldn't say sign me up except I don't use lipstick, but that's awesome. Right? Like, that why is, can't that, you? Yeah, that is actually pretty cool. I mean, I could imagine if I was into lipstick, like, that would be the one I wanted. <laughs> because then you, you don't have a million colors. You don't have a million paint colors. You have one. You have this one lipstick, and then you use your phone to actually get the exact color you want. And if you have a nice enough display, you're getting true tone matching. So, like, what you see in the camera is going to be what it's like in the real world, right? And maybe if your friend has a color they, that you like, you could just, like, tap lipsticks. And just <laughs> that's it. If you or, see or like somebody wearing, if you see somebody wearing a shade you like, you just download a copy of that picture and you match to that tone. Yeah, this is. I think this is actually. I know we're kind of being you know snarky about it. This is surprisingly brilliant. Uh, there's going to be some practical like color science limitations of this in terms of the cartridge. Like you're going to buy the range of cartridges if you go more toward your red tones than and not blue lipstick like you know there's gonna be you're gonna run out of your just like your printer ink uh oh i'm out of i'm out of yellow in my rgb or i'm, out, or I'm yeah. out of green now i can only get you know purple lipstick and i can't get any other tone of lipstick just, uh, just wait until you try to buy knockoff color cartridges for this thing but then they yeah. insert a chip in it to make sure it's an authentic cartridge all that stuff is coming We've if if we've not learned anything from inkjet printers, it's it's that uh, the money is in the ink, not in the device. This is what I miss from CES, like walking the floor and seeing someone give a demo of this. You know, a paid spokesperson being super enthusiastic about this. Like there is some there is some weird bit of like dystopia and utopia right in the like some 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 walking that line between um, um, weird dystopic future um and optimistic r&d in here um any other things out of ces we want to talk about Can yeah arcade one up. arcade one up man okay it, arcade one up it, you got your mini dragon slayer how about a full stand-up one whoa okay oh. yeah or space ace now wait the, in in one console y- well in one console you get dragon slayer one two and space ace but you can choose to have Ooh. either the dragon slayer or the space ace cabinet they both right, contain the, the same games. Yeah, so they both, but they would look uh, look the part. Um, there's those two, which, you know, I always wanted a Dragon's Lair, and that's kind of cool. I don't know. I, I think I'd probably settle for the mini one that you have. Um, I don't know if I need a full, you know, what are they, three-quarter scale? I don't know if I need that big of a, of a cabinet, but it does look it does look neat. But they also have this weird Pong table, which is a stand-up, like, uh, it's like a bar table, but it's circular, and it's a four-player Pong game. But I can't for the life of me see, figure out like what the four player aspect is because pong is for those who weren't alive in the 70s is a two-player game strictly so what is this four player pong there's four paddles and you all stand around this circle and you all have a paddle and you can all apparently play i wonder if they've invented like a, a newer version of pong which is you know where the ball can go in all directions and hit any wall and you have to defend your wall and it sounds interesting mm-hmm. it's all on arcade one up.com they also have a couple other cabinets that they announced 
um x-men yeah the Pac-Man. four player four player x-men like the old school 90s x-men yeah nice and uh, uh oh tempest is looks really good so they, they did an a you know a good approximation of the tempest cabinet with the angular um you know top to it and that one has a bunch of games in it i think it has a yeah a dozen games uh lots of good uh, vector games like major havoc um missile command it has millipede adam might be interested uh, there's Killer Instinct. There's a Killer Instinct, including Battle Toads and Battle Toads Double Dragon. I think it's always interesting. Like they 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 pick the flagship marquee art. That's the thing that's going to catch the nostalgia. You know, the the, the arcade uh, classic arcade player's eye. But then they also need to make it worth their while if you're going to spend the retail price of like 400 bucks on these things and you know throw in a couple extra games. Yep. Uh, I like the Dragon Slayer one. They, they, I think that the approximation they, they did yeah. with um, the two speakers and the, um, the score on the top. Well, that's yeah. the question. Is I don't think they use seven-segment displays for that, which would be awesome, like an actual LED-style you know, seven-segment right, right. clock displays. But it might just be an LCD panel in the back. But still, um, either way, you're right. It, there, there is like multiple planes of, of display, which is nice. It's like it's authentic and... Uh, the only other, if they did do another LCD display, the only other thing that they've done that would have done that is the pinball games, which still aren't even available to buy, to buy for regular consumers yet. Although the some reviewers have them and seem to like them. It's wild. I, I mean, people love these cabinets. They've been really, really successful. I see people post all the time on on, on Reddit that's their their um, their dens and their offices with these lined up at three quarter yeah. scale. I think the that two. I think the two games I'd be waiting for them to do is uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles um, because they, I think that that they game, did that did they did they do that one Yeah, I think so. Oh. Uh, and then the Simpsons game is the other one that I have fond memories oh. of in that in that kind of uh, you know form factor. I love the Simpsons one. Bart the skateboard, March of the vacuum cleaner, Maggie being kidnapped by Mr. Burns. I never got past like the third level. <laughs> Um, some real products that, well, those are real products, but some some more core phone products. Samsung had their big unpacked event this morning. Uh, the Galaxy S21 announced. It's another big Samsung flagship phone. Um, looks very, very shiny. It uh, the, Alongside the phone announcement, they had um, the, uh, what was this? Their tile, their trackers, ultra wideband uh, tiles that you can buy for, for 30 bucks. Uh, and they announced partnerships with car companies to allow those to and, and phones to to use NFC or ultra wideband um, or um, whatever it's called the um, uh, the yeah ultra wideband to unlock your cars, which Tesla does right now, I believe, just with Bluetooth. Uh, and the, the it's in the Galaxy, it's a Galaxy S twenty one and S twenty one plus and, and the Ultra and the Ultra. S20- s21 ultra which is like twelve hundred dollars like it is the spider phone because it has you know four cameras on the back and uh they just they demoed this last year but there's like a hundred x zoom um you know that's not all optical Uh, yeah yeah, um uh, that you can do but like there's two telephoto lenses there's an ultra wide lens and then there's like you know the 108 megapixel lens on the here as well i really want to see some real world uses of this because i think a lot of the criticism about the s20 is that the software had bugs so like the focus um i within the app was was kind of messed up but like with all of this camera gear in there i actually want to see people utilize um, those two telephoto lenses together. We've seen that really well done on iPhones. Let's see it here on Samsung. And then the fact that they have like a 120 hertz display on the front. I also want to see how good that stuff looks. Uh, and I get that it's an adaptive 120 hertz. So like Samsung gets to decide what is rendering in 120 hertz. But, you know, Samsung phones have always had like the best displays going. So uh, I'm curious how good those photos are going to look on the phone. Also, this is the first Galaxy not non-Note phone that has their S Pen support. So it kind of makes the Note a little bit obsolete. I don't know if they're consolidating those phones. Uh, I think it would be smart to at this point because we're talking about the Ultra, like 6.8 inches. They're massive phones. 
Yeah, uh, I think there's still a subset of users that like the the full like almost eight inch note size though. Yeah, and then there's also no uh, micro SD storage on these as well. And we're also talking about eight hundred dollars at the low end and thousand twelve hundred dollars on the high end. Um, for these phones. Uh, but if you are waiting for the next Samsung phone, uh, those will be out relatively soon. Uh, last bit of tech, uh, Valve put out some Steam stats for what the pandemic and lockdown did for home gaming. And Oh, no. Uh, oh, no. Well, This is going to be brutal, right? Like everyone a, spent... A 50% increase in our spent over 2019. Wait, I'm yeah. sorry. Well, I'm I'm doing work at the same time as podcasting. I'm a horrible host. Can you just repeat what you just said? Steam gamers played games 50 percent more in 2020 over tw- number of hours than, than in 2019. 50 percent. Wow. 50 percent. Yeah, and and, number all, of and only buyers, a quarter of. Th- only a quarter of that was rebooting Cyberpunk. So, like, you know, it's like... <laughs> they don't include downloading games and updating games and that. This is in-game playtime. That's crazy. That's a uh, massive, I... massive increase of in sheer number of hours played. And, and that doesn't, you know, translate to sales. But, you know, it's it's competitive in terms of how many uh, how platforms are out there, right? The Epic Store with Fortnite, that's, that's, that's massive as well. But for Steam, you know, a 50% increase is... 31 billion hours playing PC games in 2020. Uh, the VR part of it, though, also interesting. Um, 1.7 million first time VR users in 2020, and 104 million Steam VR sessions were launched. I don't, I don't know what that means, but it it's great. It's great. And for the games industry, I mean, people have been buying games like crazy over the past year. And and same with the streaming services. It seems like if there's things we can do at home, that's now we can, you know, do them more often. But I mean, that that just speaks to not not only the the, the need for that kind of entertainment, but just how good the model of of streaming is and, and digital distribution. Like the fact that. The fact that nobody can buy a GTX, you know, 3080 right now or a PS5 is because it's physical and you can't get them out in the stores and can't manufacture enough of them. But the reason why people are playing so many games is because there's infinite supply. And so people are able to do that. And so it's like it's it's as the sky is the limit. And uh, I guess we saw where that limit is in 2020. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, back to, to VR sales increased 32 percent over 2019. But. Uh, can you guess what the average playtime session was in Steam VR? I think this is uh, probably not surprising for for VR players. I mean, it's I would guess that it's all over the map. Like yeah. you have people playing sure. all day, and then you have people just trying it for five minutes. I, I would say half hour. It's thirty two minutes. Yeah, I was going to say thirty five minutes, and we are really looking for the median time, not the mean time. Let's <laughs> let's get precise here with our statistics. Yeah, we we want the the middle thirty percent, right? Um, all right, uh, let's do a really quick a VR minute and wrap up the show. The VR minute, virtual reality this week. So only one really big piece of VR news this week, and it relates to SideQuest. On SideQuest, uh, launch is Doom 3 for Quest. Isn't this Doom great? Doom 3 VR. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, in, in so many ways, for me, it is the first game that I associate with the Oculus Rift because it's the game that, that John Carmack demoed behind closed doors at E3 like 2012 or whatever event that was. You know, it was before the the Oculus Rift Kickstarter was even announced. It was just a figment in Palmer Lucky's brain, and he had sent his prototype of this duct taped together device that that Carmack, you know, said, "Okay, this has the potential to to be that first VR device." He got Doom BFG at the time running on it, and he brought people out behind closed doors, and that was the first, you know. It was probably only three DOF, right? Like uh, in terms of head trans, uh, head head rotation um, experience that people had, had, and and now like we we never really got an official release of it, and we still don't. But it was released on Quest, 
which to me is like the mind blowing part. Yeah, you know, playing it on PC is one thing, but to have ported this to Quest and Quest Two is remarkable. And I guess that's largely not only thanks to to Team Beef, Doctor Beef, and, and his team, but uh, the person who originally ported Doom Three to Android and got it running on multi core because that's what allowed it to to run at frame rate on the uh, on the Quest processor. So props, and it's it plays fantastic, and it is what it. I believe it's the it's the best version of it. It is what it always wanted to be, which is a a terrifying haunted house. And this is all made possible because the source code, of course, was released publicly all those years ago for Doom, and so people have been able, been able to tap into and make their own mods and adapt it for Android multi-core compatibility, like you said. Uh, of course, Dr. Beef and his team have a lot of experience porting let those id games to to quest uh, with uh, the quick one and two ports, Return of Castle Wolfenstein, which also was an amazing port. Uh, this is all legal because of that public source code and it's not the assets of the game so you still have to buy doom and you actually don't want the bfg edition you want just doom 3 vanilla you can buy it on steam it's super cheap and five bucks just, right five bucks you take those pack files drag it in you have to do some things for side quests like you know enter developer mode and and go through those hoops it really is really simple process and i'm shocked at how well it runs there are a lot of configuration options for it to run um to optimize it for quest one and two so you can run at 60 hertz 72 hertz change your super sampling or 90 um or, or even 90 hertz although I, I don't think it's recommended at 90 hertz nope. uh, for performance reasons and yeah there's some things like the game was never designed for vr but i'm i was shocked by how well they got the motion control is working. Two hand multi controls, one hand for the flashlight, one hand for your weapon. Um, and that game was really felt like it was designed to hold the flashlight, aim it in one direction, and run away with your thumbsticks and and shoot at zombies. And uh, it does. And and, and, and uh, the, the aliens. And you didn't even mention the interfaces. You walk up to a to a screen, and they were always like supposed to be touch screen. But at the time, like as I recall, if you got up to when you activated one. It took over your mouse, and then you'd like aim at the button, and you'd click on it. But now you physically tap them, like with your finger, and it's absolutely seamless. Like it feels like that's the way it was designed, and it plays better that way too. Totally, yeah. The way it captured your mouse, like the the your mouse look, right? When you're playing back Doom Three with your your mouse, your cursor was always the center of the screen. But once you got it to a console, those consoles was one of the great things that John Carmack and the engineering team it did. Like they they had really active UI. It wasn't right. just like these flat textures. You could read the text. You're meant to read that PDA. Uh, and and same same with the um the kind of animations. I think he knew the team knew back then. Like animations were free like live like bring worlds to, to life right like the, the all the mechanics of the mars base and all the unfolding you know uh, staircases and and like robotic stuff that all looks so much better in vr because the geometry is relatively low textures are are relatively low um but the game is still scary and a whole lot of fun yep uh, so check that out it's doom 3 quest on side quests super easy to install it and thank the dr beef and the team for making that happen um oculus also announced that they're doing multi-user accounts coming soon for the quest finally and shared apps between those accounts so in a family if you have one quest or quest two uh you can have multiple users with your different profiles for things like you know, oculus move and your high scores and your friends list uh, but you can share between purchases between those users in your family which is a lot i missed that news feature. that is long yeah that's a long time coming that's great yeah and i think uh they also said the ability for developers to get apps into sort of their version, I guess, of side quests without having certification. That's coming sooner than we expect as well. But, you know, I'd say still still check out side quests. A lot of great stuff on there. Uh, all right. That does it for the episode this week. We'll be back next week to probably recap WandaVision um, and talk about any last bits of news out of CES. But until then, here is an outro also from Great Job. Here we go. Hi there, I didn't see you. Pass it. You 
think mud there's masks a spa and... in Moss Eisley? That's not the look, Moss Eisley look, I remember. There's a 1% everywhere, Kishore. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Where do you think Jabba goes when he's in town? He doesn't He doesn't go stay down at the at the Tatooine Canteen. Oh, he clearly has one on retainer. A massage right. therapist on retainer. Right. That little that Kowakian monkey comes in and <laughs> gets all sorts of places you don't want to know. <laughs> Sign me up, dude. Perfect for the Mando, season three. All right, we'll see you next week.